Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to FSS Africa Payment Focus. We appreciate that so many of you have joined from across the continent and from other parts of the world. My name is Rishi Pillay, and I am the regional head for FSS in Africa. FSS comprehensive payments portfolio enables banks, central regulators, governments, financial intermediaries, merchants, and payment associations to leverage opportunities in today's dynamic digital world. Our solutions help clients transform businesses digitally, improving performance, technology, and operational efficiency in six key areas. Payment processing and switching, issuance, acquiring, digital banking, digital security, and back office operations. Globally, 2,500 plus payment domain experts and payment system integration specialists bring together strategy, consulting, and execution to provide clients a leading edge. Today's webinar is entitled Emerging Revenue Opp Opportunities, Leveraging Prepaid Platforms. Our panelists will share their unique experiences and insights garnered over many years and across multiple countries in Africa. It is my privilege to introduce the panelists. Our first panelist is Femi Williams. Femi has over 33 years experience covering engineering, strategy, merger and acquisition, product and market development, general management, and board level service. He has implemented bespoke information technology solutions to local and international clients on complex and transactional challenges, steered corporate commercial transactions, regulatory and compliance issues, patent, trademark, copyright, database protection, and corporate governance for several organizations. Femi was previously Group Managing Director of Charms in Nigeria. He is presently the National Chairman, Publicity Events and Trade Services of Nigeria Computer Society. Welcome, Femi. Our next panelist is Somu Roy. Somu is the Chief Business Officer at Tutuka, a global payment processing company with clients across 35 markets. Based in Dubai, Somo is responsible for the company's global expansion, executing emerging payment technologies and deepening business alliances with global partners and stakeholders. Previously, Somo had spent 10 years with MasterCard and most recently was a general manager of Qatar, Kuwait and Levant. Having held senior leadership positions at MasterCard, Somo brings a wealth of experience to the role with a solid understanding of the wide digital and emerging payment landscape. Prior to that, Somu had multiple leadership roles within MasterCard, contributing to the company's growth in his capacity as Vice President, Head of Key Accounts, Middle East Africa, and Vice President, Head of Business for KSA and Country Manager for Bahrain. Welcome, Somu. Thanks for having me, Rishi. Pleasure. Our third panelist is Zamo Mtiani. He is the founder and chief executive officer of Electronic Connect, a fintech company responsible for operating a grant payment system currently servicing over 8 million social service beneficiaries in South Africa, dispersing over $1 billion and processing over 33 million transactions every month. Zamo is a qualified electrical engineer with 19 years experience in the IT, telecommunications and banking sectors. His experience with major MNOs include MTN Nigeria, Vodacom South Africa, and Virgin Mobile. Zamo is a resolute, tenacious, and innovative leader who blends considerable technical know-how with extensive strategic prowess and the ability to execute large-scale projects successfully. Welcome, Zamo. Welcome, uh, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Rishi. Welcome. Our last panelist is Satish Narayana Mohan. Satish is an agile techno-functional product expert 
with over 20 years of experience in the fintech space and has launched globally recognized products. A natural leader who has worked with banks and technology partners across the globe on a wide array of banking products in various leadership roles, strategizing the way forward for the organization and taking care of revenue and PL responsibilities. His two decades of experience covers a diverse customer base across the US, EMEA, APEC, and SARC. Currently, Satish heads the product division at FSS. He is responsible for the product strategy, vision, engineering, marketing, product management office globally across all product lines, including acquiring, issuance, smart back office, digital security, EF inclusive, digital retail payments, analytics and data science. Welcome Satish. Thanks Rishi, look forward. Great. I'll be going over a few housekeeping items before we get started. So all the attendees are in listen in only mode. If you are, so you're not able to ask questions verbally, but please submit your questions in writing through the Q and A area on your screen. Feel free to send them to us during the webinar. Gentlemen, thank you once again for, for joining on this, this webinar. Really look forward to the discussion that uh, we're going to have today. Somo, perhaps I can uh, start with you. Um, the first question that uh, I'd like to cover, or topic I'd like to cover is the following. The prepaid platforms are pushing the boundary of what a card can do, enabling firms to bring new and innovative banking solutions to market. What are some of the new opportunities post-pandemic for prepaid or card issuance in Africa? Um, thanks, Rishi. I mean, I mean, it's a great question. You, you mentioned post-pandemic, you also mentioned Africa. But as I look at it holistically, I mean, Africa had been an economic powerhouse and driving this so-called inclusive growth and digitization for almost a decade. Um, it's home to some of the biggest global case studies, including HBR case studies like Safaricom, M-Pesa, uh, some of the large e-com marketplaces like Jumia. So the continent has been a trailblazer in the use of mobile payments um, to sidestep the lack of banking infrastructure. Along comes COVID. Now, what pandemic does, it, it predominantly does two things. One, it creates a serious restriction of movement so no face-to-face -face payments and hence e-commerce took a huge leapfrog jump. I was speaking to a very large e-com retailer in South Africa and he said, uh, post COVID started, some of their daily sales were 1.5 to 2X of Black Friday sales. Um, and hence with e-commerce came remote payments, staying at home, enjoying home entertainment, Netflix, which also requires a payment and, and a heavy usage of cards there or payment protocols. The second thing that pandemic also did is, is people's worry about handling cash. Um, cash can bring germs and enhance cards, prepaid cards, debit cards, contactless cards. Um, also, the, if you remember the schemes, uh, the network players, MasterCard, Visa, did a con contactless mandate a couple of years back, which kind of came pretty handy um, in, this, in this people's worry of handling cash. Um, at the same time, what pandemic also did is customers started demanding interoperability outside their ecosystem. So there were mobile wallets. They were happy earlier to transact within their ecosystem. Now they are asking for more. And hence, if you see a surge of partnership announcement came, m -Pesa announced with Visa, STC Pay, one large telco announced with Visa, MTN announced with MasterCard. Why this network players with the tech telco? It's, it's giving the customer a tool and more importantly here, a card or a prepaid card to reach merchants beyond the ecosystem, especially the local merchants, which is often you see a local presence, but these are cross-border merchants like Uber, Netflix, um, and them. Lastly, um, what pandemic also did, it created a huge logistic challenge on delivery of products, 
but at the same time delivery of cards. Uh, and hence a new proposition came in for prepaid, which is digital first, not necessarily a customer needs a physical four or $5 plastic card with a chip. Can they get a 16 digit number with the expiry date? And hence, as we call it CAS or card as a service uh, became immensely important post COVID and it will remain the heart of the journey in the post pandemic story. Thanks, thanks, Zomo, for that comprehensive uh, answer. Zomo, following on from that, based on what you've seen in South Africa, also especially relating to the um, social grant uh, disbursements, what, um, what can you see relating to uh, this topic? No, th thanks, thanks, Rishi. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, Yes, I will probably be more practical and use uh, uh, our experience in the, in, in the South African uh, context. Um, so the person or, or government to person uh, where government needs to disperse funds uh, is largely still driven uh, through, the, through the prepaid card. That's actually what we are using today for for, for, for the SASA environment, uh, where, we, where, where the, the local state bank has issued over uh, 9 million cards to beneficiaries to receive uh, the, the, their grants. Um, so, uh, the, 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 so even, even whilst there's an emergence of uh, all these uh, mobile wallets uh, and uh, other QR, codes based instrument in that market segments, uh, prepaid card is still probably the biggest uh, instrument that is adopted um, uh, by, 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 by those users, just because uh, it's also simpler to use, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you can also in, have a lot of innovation by uh, uh, adding on the chip, adding uh, offline capability, uh, such as uh, adding biometric payments, on, which is part of our next phase, actually, of, 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 of our grant disbursement service, is to add biometric on, on the card and also to uh, add value on, 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 on the cards. So that's where, where we'll be seeing, especially in, in, in the rural areas uh, where there is a lack of connectivity, we're seeing a big drive of having some form of either value of some form of identification on the card. Uh, that is also sparing a lot of other uh, uh, opportunities, especially in the transport space. I mean, uh, probably you guys will know in South Africa, we've just uh, uh, recently, well, not recently in the past think, five years, have a, 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 a train, uh, what's called how train, which, is, uh, which used to um, issue a closed loop card and, and have since transitioned to an, uh, an open-based system. Uh, however, that system is, can only be used by uh, customers who have, uh, um, who have a, 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 a product uh, which is a high-end product where the, based on their risk profile, the bank is able to have a, uh, uh, to enable the customers to have a, an offline limit that is probably higher than, 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 than usual, which then enables them to, to, to tap and use an offline based EMV service in, in a how train. But that cannot work for the lower LSMs because lower LSMs, the banks do not want to take risks. They cannot afford to have an offline authentication. So you then need to uh, load the value on the card. Uh, and that's why we think we're still going to uh, see a, a big need for, for card solution, uh, which can be linked to a, a wallet, but to enable largely uh, offline authentication and, 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 and offline payments. Thank you. Thanks, Lamo. Femi, have you seen a similar impact post COVID in Nigeria? 
Okay, thank you, um, everyone. Uh, Nigeria, the regulatory system uh, discourages uh, closed system in a way. So what you find is um, a variant of the open prepare systems. Um, a lot of banks now do um, uh, 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 virtual cards uh, in order to reach out for to the to the unbanked, and then uh, agency network is also developing rapidly. So people use card to move credit, bulk credit to a terminal somewhere, and then there's an agency seated all over the country. I think the goal is to do over 50,000 agents uh, this year, and the project is moving on well. Uh, what you find that is prevalent, that is growing rapidly here is the agency intervention uh, because the infrastructure did not grow rapidly and uh, the regulatory system did not support a closed system. So open system required the infrastructure to get to those remote villages. So with this advent of uh, COVID, uh, agency network is growing rapidly. Thank you. Thanks, Femi. Satish, following on from that, um, there's, there's been consumer reluctance to visit branches, and there's obviously growth in embedded payments, um, which is becoming drivers for launching a digital first card program. Um, is there a trend towards app-based virtual card issuance, uh, like uh, what Somo mentioned, rather than physical plastic? Uh, and what use cases and demographics are typically being targeted in such programs? So good morning, everyone. Thanks, Rishi, for the question. Um, interesting, it has multiple aspects to it. Um, you know, the br branch visit by customers over the years has been declining globally. And uh, in many markets, uh, the shift from brick and mortar to digital has been something that's been happening in different markets and banks have been heavily investing on it. With the advent of pandemic, uh, you know, there was no other choice but to accelerate the digital transformation and give more, more choice and channels for customers to engage, uh, to transact and do their basic needs through a digital means. And hence, uh, uh, you know, it is no more a reluctance to visit branch. It's like, do I have a choice? You know, I don't have a choice to go to the branch in the current context. And uh, probably that kind of uh, accelerated the uh, digital transaction, the volume of transactions globally shows you, the data shows us that, you know, the kind of transactions that are happening today on the digital front. Uh, with with what's happening with that is also the whole aspect of the whole embedded finance, right? So uh, with embedded finance, I think what we are trying to address is, uh, uh, which is clearly going to be the future financial uh, service uh, industry, right? It's uh, where you try to make sure that uh, all the different uh, uh, service providers uh, who are like the retailers or any business players or merchants who would need a financial service provider to help in their financial needs will often see that a customer or consumer coming to them, you know, has to hop from a particular transaction or a purchase that they're trying to do to a financial service provider. And that most often is a friction, it's a pain point from a consumer standpoint. And uh, clearly these are, clearly these are uh, uh, those hops which actually reduces or declines uh, some of the transaction which could potentially happen. And how do we, you know, embedded finance is definitely focused towards reducing that friction and embedded payments is going to be significantly huge. Uh, already they are in practice, you know, um, all the ride share, ride hailing companies like the Ubers kind of introduced it way back. And, uh, you know, you, you, you know, today you don't even realize the payment has happened. You're just focused on going to your destination. So that's how uh, ubiquitous the payment has become in this context and more and more such players uh, would start you know embedding payments into their architecture so that uh, the seamless experience for a customer becomes uh, uh, of uh, prominence um, so what what kind of trends are showing towards uh, you know if i look at what's the trends towards virtual card issuance is primarily uh, because with the embedded payments option um, with the the customers has a choice to kind of uh, uh, have uh, more choice of picking up a virtual card than a physical card, right? In the today's context, uh, I think they can simply shave off the cost of about two to $5 for a financial institution. Uh, and depending on the scale of the prepaid cards that they are marketing, the it's, it runs at a few millions if you really operate it well. So virtual cards are fairly convenient from both the financial institution side and the business side. And from a consumer standpoint, as Somo pointed out, it's just a 16 digit number. 
that gets uh, you know passed on to you for you to start transacting immediately, which is a huge convenience standpoint. So I see the virtual card has definitely grown. Uh, you know, uh, the numbers have grown, and from a prepaid context, this is a big adoption because people see a convenience to have a specific uh, prepaid you know kind of funds for doing specific transaction kind of helps them handle their uh, transaction limit their risk exposure and more importantly uh, if you talk about the demographics which are kind of adopting to it uh, it's mostly the younger generations uh, or the gen z and the millennials because uh, identity theft which is a big thing that's happening in pretty much most market with uh, the, with the advent of di digital they're kind of completely risk prone by not having any identity linked to a prepaid virtual card um, and that's a big advantage for most of them and uh, uh, in most other markets uh, like in africa you see south africa kenya nigeria are far more in terms of counts of cards uh, as opposed to the other markets are significantly on the higher side but Kenya, for example, is more on the debit card. They're less on the uh, credit, right? But so they would naturally trend towards a virtual prepay card, which is far more convenient for them. And uh, so I see that um, I see that from a business standpoint, uh, prepaid, whether it's virtual or physical, is a significant. Today we are doing about two trillion globally, and it's kind of expected to hit about a twenty billion dollar by the end of uh, twenty thirty, which is at a you know growing by this twenty two. 0.5 CAGR and globally this numbers has been increasing and this pandemic has also showed that though there have been certain dips probably because like the way Somo pointed out there are challenges in terms of distributing these uh, physical cards and uh, you know how enabled are you to give, give those virtual cards could have been the reason but I'm seeing that this will spike up in the next few months in different geographies as uh, financial institutions and and the card providers would start, you know, accelerating on the digital adoption to make those things happen. So, definitely a huge opportunity. Um, number of use cases uh, are pretty much there. You know, be it from government benefit to payroll to students to insurance or health. Uh, you know, you can keep adding to it and uh, more easily for people who have uh, who are having already credit and debit cards would choose to have a prepaid virtual card for certain set of transaction for e-commerce for fuel you know that kind of gives them a kind of a control and a risk exposure limited and those are huge business opportunity for us and uh, new ways of increasing your revenue for a financial institution or a business as they move forward in this thanks thanks satish Femi, um in africa's largest economy and, and in west africa in general are you seeing a similar trend uh, in terms of prepaid, you know, um, being a preferred option almost for online commerce and, uh, you know, definitely an increased adoption uh, in the region? Yes, please. Um, he has mentioned a bit about the uh, identity issue, which is a serious issue for us in Africa. Um, complying with the KYC requirements of traditional banking is difficult. So prepaid card is it is uh, we can see it grown and then the risk um, has also increased the, the 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 adoption of prepaid. Um, many people for risk purposes, some people for convenience purposes, and most people for actually regulating themselves against impulse purchase. So you create your budget, you load your work card, and that's all you can spend in a month or in a uh, the period. Uh, which you load the money on it. Uh, therefore, what we find in Nigeria, uh, especially here, is uh, number one, virtual card, mobile uh, uh, prepaid uh, system is growing in, in, in leaps and bounds. He has mentioned the challenges with cards. So the amount of card issue seems to be reducing uh, gradually. But for the unbanked, what we find is a bulk. In other words, agency network is growing very, very rapidly. And then the agent managers are using bulk card to move funds from the bank to the villages where there are no connectivity at all in order to make cash available to the people. That's the trend we've seen here. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Femi. Uh, so, uh, so uh, are, you, are you seeing that uh, at, at Tutuka as well in terms of more and more programs to enable uh, online commerce? Um, specifically. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely, and 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 with spot on, Satish uh, and 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 Femi. Yeah, we are seeing some 
exponential growth and especially on the on the digital first like the 16 digit number side um i mean satish very very eloquently uh, shared the story if i may just add up to that it started with the zen z um uh, the the tech savvy uh, folks but as the as the as the development of ussd came in where without a smartphone you can pretty much generate a 16 digit card we are interestingly seeing an increased adoption adoption to till little higher age group which we don't consider as as gen z because again as i said covid kind of restricted the movement so the way telcos kind of working with the mobile wallets and and enforces enforcing the ussd based 16 digit virtual card uh, generation it's opening a lot of lot of uh, new opportunities last but not the least we are talking consumer payments a uh, interesting journey that that we are going through in tutuka we are enabling one of the world's largest travel aggregator agoda um, who completely moved out of their check and swift based payment to a virtual card based payment to their supplier so it's not a consumer it's rishi goes to london and books a ticket through agoda how agoda will pay hilton they they initiate a 16 digit number that 16 digit number gets mailed to them and the hotel kind of books it so there is a very increasing digital first business to business payment we are seeing coming up in the long way well wow, it's pretty interesting just just talking on to that point about ussd as a channel uh, very interesting and how, how is that enabling um, financial inclusion um both for banks and and other financial services providers and and increasingly a lot of fintechs and um, you know how can these eventually be transitioned into more mainstream financial services that's 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 a fascinating question i mean if we look at africa um africa's journey um on the financial inclusion was driven by two pillars not was it still one is telcos which has really the largest reach in those markets often and most often uh, way higher than the banks uh, and they have both the customer as well as the small merchants both as their customers so they are perfect scalable for the ecosystem though but the second largest pillar is the fintech why because fintechs brings the super execution and speed on on how to make it happen so if you look at together i mean we will pick up one example kenya when mpesa started kenya's financial inclusion rate 2007 was about in 20s 21 22% now it's 84% as of last year and a large play was was done by the mnos the wallets and now the virtual card coming with the with the with the wallets um how it brings the whole ecosystem together it's because it's not about the financial inclusion it's also about financial health are they part of the inclusion or what they are doing now there's a very interesting story in kenya there is lady uh, who wakes up at 3 am um, uses her mpesa wallet takes a loan goes to the regular market at 5 am buys vegetables and meat goes to the construction site cooks the food for the construction employee feeds them gets money and in the evening paid back now what it does it creates record of transaction so from a completely gray economy not a black economy now a mobile wallet can see the transaction and the transaction record so as the financial health is improving the mobile wallets are giving them access to cards it's starting with prepaid card and data is the new currency data is the new new oil so the prepaid card is creating more records by which the mobile wallets kind of underwriting them giving access to more credit the same lady now has five other ladies employed under her so it's kind of a msme now so probably they will accept qr and code so it mm. builds a ecosystem by complementing each other the other beautiful piece is that because of the access again i'm taking a kenya example mps almost holds more than 50% of inbound remittances it's not only about issuing the card you have to get the funds from somewhere so it's kind of coming from outside holding into the wallet and then with a virtual card they're doing bill pay netflix uber amazon and the sky is the limit so it's perfectly complementing 
each other and the data that's creating, that's the essence of building the financial hub. Fantastic. Zamo, what are you seeing uh, from a South African perspective, uh, especially related to financial inclusion and, and the whole uh, channel mix that uh, that's emerging? Yeah, Rishid, no. So the, 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 firstly, I think the, it's important to note that the biggest driver, the biggest driver of uh, deposits uh, in, in the lower LSMs, when I say deposits, to receive the money into a store value is still largely government. I mean, in our case, uh, the state uh, distributes close to uh, 270 billion rands every, every, um, every year. Uh, so that's the, in, 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 this, in, a, in the South African context, uh, in that lower LSM, the state is still the biggest driver of money in into a store of value, right? Now, what we're seeing is that obviously, the, as, 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 as it stands today, the store of value is linked with the card, with the, uh, which is associated with uh, Visa in our, in our case, um, uh, and which is issued to uh, 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 an improvised uh, uh, beneficiary that's in the in, in in the lower LSM. What what happens is they they, they receive this uh, money, uh, but just because the current uh, banking infrastructure, I mean, this is probably a South African context, and then the, the banking infrastructure is all situated in the in the urban areas. Uh, so as much as these uh, beneficiaries are living in the in the peri or rural urban areas, the actual infrastructure. To be able to use that payment instrument is situated in situated in areas which they have to incur an expense uh, to, to 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 travel, right? Uh, and when they get to those uh, uh, urban areas, they they either use the their payment instruments at uh, at the at the, at an ATM which is bank owned by the banks, or they will use their cards uh, the retail which is also owned by the banks, but at at at, at retail. Uh, so what happens in that, for example, in our case, we, we disperse close to 14 billion rands every month. 95% of that uh, money is then automatically spent in, 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 the, in the urban areas. So that then creates this uh, continued segregation uh, where the richer are getting more richer and the poor are getting poor. So what, what we're seeing as a, as a solution, which is what we think uh, fintechs such as ourselves, uh, working with government should really drive is how do we bring uh, payment infrastructure into the rural areas and make that closer to the, to, to the people, uh, to the communities. But however, that is not only what we, needs to be done. You also need to ensure that uh, the goods, uh, because what we've seen, I mean, the, the, these beneficiaries or these uh, recipients, they really don't, uh, uh, their basket is full of probably about five or six items, right? Largely, you know, milli meal, samp, beans, but it, it's small items that they, they have to buy. So they incur an expense to travel to an urban areas to buy these few items. And then they have to also incur an expense to travel with these items back into the rural areas. So we're saying bring the payments, or at least we want, we are saying FinTech companies such as ourselves working with the retail, bring the payment infrastructure into the closer to where people are, but more importantly, bring, bring the goods to the local merchants and create this ecosystem where um, those goods can be purchased uh, locally uh, as a service. And I think what is also what is the biggest, biggest opportunity is then for the driver of uh, the deposit, which is the state, uh, when they disperse this money, the state really uh, is giving this money to ensure that people can buy basic items such as food. They actually don't want users to, or, or these beneficiaries to buy items like alcohol. So the next biggest opportunity is to say, how do you then make sure that even the expenditure or the purchases or the payment is purpose-based? So you say, I'm giving you this money, but spend it on these specific items across these specific merchants. And that will be, uh, I think for me, a catalyst where you can actually drive that inclusion uh, because you need the money to circulate in those local com lo local communities for 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 uh, the upliftment of those uh, so societies. Thank you. Thanks, Samo. Satish, um, you know what are you seeing? Uh, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, with respect to acceptance, uh, you know. So obviously, when it comes to 
especially card-based instruments, you need an acceptance infrastructure. And, um, you know, um, what are you seeing as a limiting factor or what are some innovative uh, new uh, channels emerging to enable acceptance? So, um, so Rishi, I think, uh, again, thanks to, thanks to the pandemic, uh, uh, particularly in the context of uh, prepaid, uh, we've been looking at it, uh, you know, I'll probably start off with Africa as a continent, uh, which is our focus today, and probably talk about the global perspective on this one. Uh, uh, while, while we see the uh, trends, particularly in the African market, we talked about it, uh, debit being the most prevalent one. A prepaid adoption in the market has been of uh, significant scale, you know, uh, and uh, we've seen that uh, trend increasing in the market, like the market like Africa. Though uh, the next few years of projection, which has been shown there, is of uh, prominence, saying, uh, saying how this is bound to grow. Uh, in terms of uh, acceptance, I think uh, uh, you know the uh, the pandemic has kind of driven the need for more of contactless. Uh, uh, kind of an acceptance. Um, so with the virtual, with the virtual card helping us predominantly on the, on the kind of uh, card not present scenario with, uh, you know, e-commerce kind of transaction, it becomes far more convenient. Uh, but for uh, physical transaction, the need for, uh, uh, you know, a contactless uh, is something that's more prominent for adoption globally. This is uh, again uh, a phenomenon that we are seeing. But equally so, the market. When you need to provide those kind of uh, uh, kind of capability uh, as a issuer or as a business, it's obviously going to drive your cost. And uh, what then comes into play is in in terms of uh, how do you still increase adoption of these products and not drive your fees and transaction uh, cost, uh, but still still keep them lower for people to come and transact more because that's when you do better business with them. And which is connecting to the topic that we're discussing today. How do I make more newer revenue models with this option, increasing adoption, giving convenience to the customer consumers and still keeping your cost low. So, so the need for prepaids, which technically were mostly for uh, a very specific need like a government benefit or for a travel requirements uh, has now become more prominent because it's shifting to virtual. It's uh, it, the need for contactless has become very high thanks to pandemic and hence the cost of it has gone up so what are the other value added service that you'll bring around these products so that uh, there are newer ways of uh, monetizing and improving your revenue models and hence and hence increase the need, uh, hence increase the option for the customers and consumers to use your products more so so globally market has gone towards uh, more of contactless and uh, you know use of uh, e-commerce based transaction with these and prepaid has shown increased trend in terms of adoption in different markets for different needs, uh, Rishi. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Satish. Femi, uh, following on from that, um, especially as it relates to uh, acceptance and also as it relates to enabling the entire ecosystem, uh, th there's about 100 million MSMEs in Africa and many are reliant on cash. And the, the pandemic has really foregrounded the need for rapid digitization. So what strategies can issuers adopt to bring small and medium enterprises on board? Okay, um, thank you. Apart from uh, the developed world that started from credit card, most African nation starts from a closed uh, loop payment system. That is a system that is designed to be accepted in probably one or two or few merchants and for a single purpose. But the trend normally is that after some time, you find out that the consumers will want to use the same fund to do more. And hence, the need for closed system will die and then open system will take over. Okay. And if you look at our, economy, our, our situation in Nigeria, uh, the regulatory system really did not support closed system now. So everything is open. Uh, the trend is that the debit card is where everybody is being transited to. Uh, because in Nigeria today, if you open an account, you get a debit card, whether you like it or not, by force, banks will give you. 
And once they give that to you, you can then start to create virtual cars that are related to it. And for areas where technology infrastructure don't get to, uh, and I'll give you a good example. The recently, government wanted to do some incentive to pay the very poor people and to pay them some little money every month. Um, what happened was the first scheme, people gave those people loan, uh, cards and uh, they gave them actually uh, debit cards. And yes, money will get into the cards, but there are no acceptance points in the villages or in the rural areas. So what uh, the only strategy our government is doing now, right, is the agency to bridge the gap where there is no infrastructure, no technology, power is poor, because cash is acceptable in those areas. And the agent will use bulk card to move money from where there is infrastructure, where there is connectivity, where there are banks, to the remote villages. Uh, we have some um, security challenge in the north, uh, uh, eastern, well, north eastern part of Nigeria. In a whole state, that state has just like 36 branches of bank, and they are concentrated in the capital city. And the city, the, 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 the state I'm talking about, like five times the size of Lagos State. So there is huge, huge expanse of land and places and people that don't have access to the technology. So what banks are doing is anyone that is get that gets into the banking system, you get a debit card. Now with the debit card, uh, and government has created tier one, tier two, tier three. So there is a tier one debit card with very low KYC requirements. Uh, that means there are limited amount of money you can transact in one day. You can move to tier two when you provide a lot more KYC, and then before you can become a full debit card client. All these are strategies that people, Nigerian system or payment infrastructure and system had used in order to uh, uh, make payments reach the, 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 the last mile. Thanks, Femi. Somo, what are you seeing in terms of um, MSMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises, um, and their utilization of uh, prepaid instruments. Now, are there any interesting use cases that, that you see? Yeah, it's the MSME area is fascinating and it, it starts with what I earlier said, a card is a 16 digit number. And I mean, of course, Agoda is not MSME, but when Agoda is paying a small hotel uh, through a 16 digit number, so we know card as a service, the 16 digit number can be at the heart of the ecosystem. You can call it a check, you can call it a swift payment, it, anything can be replaced by the 16 digit number. Um, so there is a project I'm very close to, but that's in that's in Latin America and, and it's, it's actually coming to Middle East Africa where in Brazil, uh, actually it's Warren Buff is one of the investment of the company called Stone. What they created, what a merchant needs. A merchant needs a terminal and a 16 digit number. A consumer puts, swipes the 16 digit number, uses QR, but the money does not get, there is no settlement bank. That money goes to the 16 digit number in the merchant's app. That creates data. And as, as I say, data is the new currency. So depending on that, Stone gives loan to merchants. These are a per perfect MSME case. Uh, Stone gives loan to these, these merchants and they build a merchant base which is a merchant banking. So it's kind of a bank which only has MSMEs. It's immensely successful in Brazil. Um, Stone is owned by a company called Salt uh, or partnered and they are now launching it in Portugal. A similar kind of ecosystem where if we can just not call them a card, but it is a card, but it's mm -hmm. a 16 digit number replacing a check, swift payment or anything, this will work seamlessly. And, why it's so important for Africa, I was looking at a Forbes article, this $400 machine and a $5 card, that won't work in Africa. It won't work in a lot of parts of the world, but definitely not in Africa. And, and how we do a QR based, a virtual card based, where the cost is zero. So if you think about it, a USSD based 16 digit number generation and merchant just has a sticker. And if they can work in a right ecosystem, of course, managing the identity theft and fraud issues and all, that's the way um, Africa will evolve and the journey is coming, I feel. Crazy. Thank you. Satish, uh, drawing on you know, other emerging markets, um, what are you seeing in India regarding um, MSMEs and uh, you know, their 
access into the economy using these these instruments. Sorry. Yeah. So, Rishi, I think uh, now the whole aspect of embedded payments will make a big impact uh, for the MSME segments. I think uh, uh, the biggest challenge for MSME uh, is uh, the access to capital. And, uh, you know, in irrespective of whichever market you are talking about, um, every market is having similar challenge, right? And the time to get a capital uh, it ranges for, with a proper traditional financial system. It ranges anywhere between 60 to 90 days. And, uh, you know, aspects like uh, these could help bridge those gaps in terms of giving them faster access to capital. Uh, and uh, uh, from the context, from the particular context of, uh, uh, from the particular context of prepaid, uh, the topic for discussion today, uh, some of the pain points are, you know, from an MSRP standpoint, uh, most of the uh, employees that they have are the blue collar kind of employees predominantly. So if you kind of give them a possibility for a payroll options, right? And the cost involved for having a payroll system in place is way too complicated for MSME. Uh, suppliers who start building value added service. So you are not only positioning a prepaid as a financial institution or a, or a card uh, or a prepaid, you know, prepaid business, you give the payroll card to the business, but you also manage the salary processing as a value added service, reduce the transaction fee for those uh, blue collared employees and that's a value add right and so what you're essentially doing is the cash flow of the sme sme becomes your customers the msme becomes your customer msme's employee become your customers the money flows through your prepaid so you have the entire uh, cash within within your business model and then you start seeing the pattern of not only the msme as a as a business but also the blue collared employees and start giving them access to you know, credit and better, better financial products. So the unbanked and underbanked get privileged. They have access to cards, which is very required in this current context. And you're also closing this loop of, uh, you know, capital and financial problems, both on MSME and the unbanked and underbanked side. So I see this as a problem, not necessarily uh, in uh, developing economies, uh, including like Africa and India and Indonesia, but even in other markets, uh, MSMEs are uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, most, uh, uh, underserved, I would say, uh, segment because the business banking segment, so to speak, in the financial services is far more complex compared to the corporate banking or the corporate customers or the retail customers. The business banking, you could have somebody who's selling a, a flower, uh, you know, who's got a bouquet shop, could be a SME customer, and you could have somebody who's actually making a engine for a Boeing, uh, who could also be on the other end of the business banking. Now, how do you then bridge this whole segment of business banking customers who are so disparate and still address their needs? And, you know, and that's a problem that, uh, you know, opportunities like this create for us to, you know, better solve. And I see a huge possibilities here. Thanks, Satish. Satish, um, moving on to some of the technology related aspects. So how is the emergence of public cloud microservices architecture and APIs impacting the competitive landscape and use cases for prepaid program management? And also has this enabled a growth spurt in the industry? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, prepaid or any program management from a card standpoint, uh, prepaid in particular, because the variety of options that you have in prepaid, given the, com given the possibilities of use case, uh, you know, we touched upon few, uh, the program management becomes a very fundamental element uh, of how you run these initiatives. You know, payroll we took as an example, uh, government benefits, the other one, and, you know, we can go on insurance, health. Um, there are quite a few use cases that we can think of. And with the advent of IoT coming in, um, I see a huge possibilities, right? So your smart devices can start ordering what they want and you can put a virtual card link to the smart device so you know that you don't bust the machine doesn't go ordering whatever it wants you know but that's uh, those are what the future is bringing up but clearly in this space what eventually is going to happen is i think the constraints that we see today are one the processing technology stack uh, and two ability to understand uh, and analyze data like somo said data uh, is the new power new oil and uh, you know how do we tap in and take information so it's not about giving a cheaper, friendlier option for the consumers in prepaid, the faster. So you need to give a virtual card within minutes, it has to be faster. 
the more you run campaigns program, you should be able to scale much faster, which means uh, your counts, you could hit 100,000 cards subscription on virtual in a single day and all the 100,000 of them would want to transact immediately on a something very, very specific to that campaign. So your, your infrastructure technology should be uh, capable enough to scale at that speed and uh, power and you while you give that you're trying to give your customer acquisition cost is significantly higher you know in different markets it varies but uh, with with those costs involved you need to start understanding these hundred thousand customers as an example you know who for that for you to understand them you need to start analyzing the data their transaction behavior the kind of products they buy the frequency of their purchase you know, so it's important that you start measuring these different metrics and for you to start making your business profitable. So technology, um, cloud becomes a, you know, a kind of an unstated need here because your ability to scale at speed uh, uh, when you run those campaigns are humongous and you have uh, different sales happening at different point in time. And, you know, for example, if a person can give a specific virtual card to their family members during let's say Christmas and say, hey, you can shop for let's say hundred dollars or something equivalent, uh, you know, in, in to their family members who could shop. So on a particular sale period, there could be the transaction volumes are going to spike. So having a cloud native uh, auto scalable platform to deal with high volume transaction and help and still ensure data security, uh, which is prevalent in every market now, how do you ensure data security for your customers and consumers? and and still, still give them a more secure uh, transaction experience. Technology is a very important element. The second aspect that I touched upon is on the data. So for you to start processing huge amount of data. So today, business is generating huge amount of data in different markets and uh, our ability to read those data and start you know, focusing on those segments of customers who are more profitable to you and start giving more personalized uh, offering to them is very important for your retention stack. Uh, retention, you know, strategies, and that's going to be very key in those aspects. So, so for and uh, the whole aspect is your platform should be more, uh, you know, collaborative in nature. You know, thanks to open banking, PSD two, and uh, various such, uh, you know, regulation which are coming up. Your ecosystem, extending your ecosystem to offer more, more uh, in an embedded finance context, or even in your conventional today business model where you want to connect with various collaborators is uh, you know is a must have and hence having apis and sdks enabled from your platform becomes uh, you know pertinent so different business are trying to address it much faster uh, they you know it's best to look at some right partners who could bring those capability in house and do their processing you focus on your core business but all these are fundamental for a successful program management for you to do your business better and uh, if you don't have those underlying foundation or infrastructure, it's probably going to, your campaigns will run, your products will sell, but how profitable are you? You may not know. Uh, which, who are the best performing customers? How do I serve them better? You may not know. So those are challenges which need to be addressed with better technology, with better insight. That's my view on that, Rishi. Thank you. Thanks, Satish. So can you uh, comment? I, I noticed on the Tutuka website, that's one of your, your key uh, value propositions and you can integrate with two lines of code and you know, APIs and uh, you know, all of these integration mechanisms are important. Yes, yeah, so strategically, we believe in two things um, and, and that's debatable, but it's one, uh, we don't have any sales pitch anymore. Uh, we tell the client what Tutuka is and give access to our API portal. And they can play around and as they learn, they give us feedback and then we go, they either like it or not like it. Um, it's not like Tutuka spearheaded it. I mean, two, three years back, all the global companies, MasterCard, Visa, Microsoft, everybody has opened it because this whole partnership, you learn more. So it's API based. Very interesting. I actually was reading an RFP that came this Monday from Europe and this is not new. This is the third time I saw it in this month and it's only seven days. Um, a FinTech slash retailer for virtual card, they're asking in eight weeks, the program needs to be live uh, without a, otherwise a clawback condition. So um, if you can think that if somebody has to go live in six to eight weeks, if they have a bin and plastic is ordered, the only way you can do it is, is, is through API. Uh, and that's why that's, that's, a, that's a major, major power play. The other interesting piece is the regulators are also changing. 
uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, which needed is Saudi Arabia, which needed a uh, data warehouse data sitting there, they're opening to AWS, not full API based and in point. So as we see, there is a shift happening in the merchants, in the fintechs on demanding and regulators are getting more nimble. Ethiopia is changing or appending some of the regulations in Africa. So I think it's the, it's the right way to do, just open API. Thanks, Omar. Shemi, are you seeing something similar in uh, the Nigerian context? Yes, uh, one uh, technology that um, translated uh, especially access to uh, virtual banking is USSD. Um, there was a case study of a bank that moved from one to six million customers switched to USSD in one month uh, with very little campaign because it was easy. Many people don't have access to uh, sophisticated phones, but USSD has done a lot of wonders. And uh, because of interoperability system in the country, so you can use USSD to move money from one bank to the other, from your account, one account to the other. Um, is not bank wanted to try to do P2P, but that has not been very, very successful. Uh, but for uh, banking to move your money from one point to the other is now very easy in Nigeria and it has changed the face of things. And it made uh, even people in the very, very rural area, people who are poor cannot afford uh, sophisticated phones uh, to adopt USSD. It's so easy. I read a case study of a woman who is an illiterate. She cannot read, she cannot write, but she got his son to save her, the USSD code. So all she will need to do is to open her phone, edit the amount, because there are two or three people that he pays. She pays regularly. She does not understand anything, but she will just open the phone, open the contact, edit the amount and send. Edit the amount and send to the three people that she pays. And she's operating payment system simply. So USSD has done a lot of wonders in Nigeria. Thanks, Femi. Somo, as a category, Forex cards are the most lucrative revenue source for issuers. As COVID-19 has impacted the traveling industry and changed consumers' mindsets for future travel, will this impact the Africa payment industry? And if yes, how can they overcome such challenges? So uh, Forex card is kind of the love child of banks, schemes, like network, everybody's, because there is this FX markup plus the interchange. Uh, but that market is evolving. I mean, COVID is one pace. There are other areas also. But if you look at COVID, um, travel, will it come back in next 12 months? Probably not. But even if it comes back, it will be a different set of travel. It's a change travel. So maybe the pool will not be as large. But at the same time, if you see the who is the worst impacted by COVID? It's the players in travel, right? The airlines, the hotels and all. Yesterday, Emirates announced they are open, launching open banking. So in Europe, so you don't need a card to pay. They are asking for banks, I mean, bank debits to be done directly for ticket purchase. Um, you must have heard last year, the EU SEPA interchange where interchange drops for cross-border from this 2% to 0.23%. So that ecosystem, the pool will drop. And hence, I think the issuers uh, need to focus on, on top of the travel, the huge domestic market. And where we talked about COVID also created e-commerce, COVID also created the cashless environment and how you milk that pie more, uh, create digital first proposition for customers. Netflix, Amazon is no more a cross-border thing. It's a part of everyday life. Uh, of a mass customer, it's no more affluent thing. Um, and, and, and hence, they need to focus on, on, on these areas and reduce the dependency on, on, on cross-border. If you look, I'm, I'm not a stock market expert, but if you look at the quarterly release of MasterCard Visa, where a big, and Amex, where is a big chunk of revenues to be this, this high margin cross-border uh, volumes that's reducing and how the domestic relevancy is coming up driven by e-commerce and digital first. Thanks, Thanks so much. Uh, Satish, um, any thoughts on, on that, on uh, retail Forex cards and uh, how you see it panning out uh, 
Actually, I think I think uh, Somo kind of uh, captured it pretty well. Uh, uh, the in travel industry is still in a uh, in a kind of uh, hold. Um, I think probably the worst hit industry uh, in this pandemic, uh, uh, and I think uh, we are not very sure when uh, the resurgence will happen on the travel and what point it will pick up. So, so definitely. Uh, the good good choice from the financial institution standpoint is to probably look at uh, they have multiple choices of uh, use cases to offer in the prepaid segment so they they have a plan b plan c if they if that's not working well but uh, from the travel industry perspective it's like a wait and watch game and uh, we'll have to see when that picks up but there is uh, what the data shows is that uh, when it opens up, it's going to really hit the roof because everybody have been locked and people are going to really go off to travel. And I think probably, hopefully, uh, uh, the business will bounce back and you're able to recoup some of the losses you would have made. Uh, but just I'm hoping for the good uh, for that uh, from our airline and travel industry standpoint. Thanks, Satish. Um, Femi, how can retailers utilize prepaid programs to drive feet through the door and engender loyalty amongst consumers? I think we, we may have lost Femi. Uh, the, the network seems, seems to be a bit slow there. Uh, Somu, maybe you can comment on that. Um, retail sure. specific, yeah. I mean, there are multiple use cases. We have seen Walmart, Ikea, where, where there is a retail prepaid card. Um, it has significantly higher loyalty between 27% to 70%, depending, depending on the retailer. Uh, it dramatically improves footfall. It drives loyalty. Um, however, as the market evolving, there are two positive changes we are seeing in the market. Uh, before, uh, even 20 years back, a retailer used to be an independent entity, but now, as we all know, we are moving into the mall culture. And an evolution of the mall culture happened. Some of the largest malls in the world, and even in Africa, they don't have retailer on a rental basis. They have retailer on a profit-sharing basis. So it's not only retailers are looking for those prepaid cards, it's malls are also looking for the retailers, uh, the, the overarching kind of cards, which... Uh, we have with Stanton City in South Africa, with Canal Walk in Cape Town, uh, one of the largest, actually the largest globally with Dubai Mall, because these malls are managing the footfall on behalf of the retailers. So uh, we, I mean, COVID took a hit for these mall footfalls because of the lockdown, but it's, 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 it's slowly coming up. The, the other very interesting twist where we are seeing, again, a digital first play here, where a mall, before that a retailer comes, but before that a supplier, like a company which supplies. Now, Samsung launched its first digital first card. There is no physical card available for that in all GCC countries together, and, and we empowered them. So what Samsung is doing, you come to the retailer, which is in a mall, but what you do, you buy a Samsung cell phone. You want a discount of $100? That $100, instead of a cashback, gets pushed into a push notification as a tokenized card and gets loaded in the Samsung Pay. Again, you want a reward for your next purchase, you get the cash back in that Samsung card. So it's very interesting how this whole play is moving retailer to mall and now to a, to a more manufacturer kind of play. But it's, it's coming back post COVID. Thanks so much. Femi, do you do you see this uh, as being uh, relevant in the informal sector as well, where uh, the the informal traders almost can also engender loyalty um, using something like uh, prepaid and uh, um, you know? So is it just um, relevant to the formal economy, or you think it can also apply to the informal economy? Yeah, it's, um, as I said, it's the informal economy actually needed it um, a, a lot more uh, because of the rigor of uh, KYC issues and uh, what it takes to maintain a bank account. Therefore, a uh, prepaid system uh, has a lot of um, application in, in, in the informal sector. 
I will give uh, some example, um, a Greek, um, where farmers are giving grants, where they are giving fertilizer rations. Uh, there's no way to control this movement, especially when you want to restrict where they can use the fund uh, than to use the prepaid system. So you can transform and translate the informal sector uh, ra ra radically. Thanks, thanks, Femi. Um, I see we have a question on the on the Q and A. Uh, with growth in e-commerce, uh, BNPL is growing. So do issuers have a play in the space? Um, any any thoughts from the panel? BNPL is 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 probably the next big thing if it's not already a big thing. Um, um, I started following BNPL before joining Tutuka when I, I was reading an article, the youngest Australian billionaire, and he became billionaire at 27 just by BNPL. Uh, uh, but now it's 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 in Mia. There is a there is a there are a couple of RFPs of BNPL players, and and the virtual card is in the heart of BNPL to make it work you need to issue that card instantly. There are multiple ones in GCC. Uh, one great thing is that they're getting amazing kind of funding, uh, both from the sovereign funds in GCC and all. So the expansion is there. There are at least six, which is already in MIA and three or four coming, which are part of the large BNPL global group, like Afterpay and Zip and all. So as we, as we go uh, with more e-commerce and all, BNPL is the true reality. If you walk around in the Dubai mall, you will see a lot of gift shops with the price. It will be written, uh, I don't want to take a particular company's name, like X BNPL's price this per month, Y BNPL's price. But yeah, this is a vertical that's, that's, that's going to be big. Thanks, Omu. Um, gentlemen, we are almost out of time. Um, Thank you very much for your, your participation. Perhaps one final thought from, from each of you um, before we wrap up the session. Satish, uh, shall we start with you? Hey, Rishi, I think, uh, so, so I think from, we had very good points that was discussed, a lot of good questions coming from you, Rishi. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, the market is opening up from a prepaid virtual perspective. There is enough and more opportunity for the industry on the whole, given the growth, it's expected to hit, uh, you know, a 20 trillion uh, projected number by 2030, and the uh, and the different prog opportunity space and different areas of use cases are significant and widespread. Uh, the critical success factor then falls into how these are program managed and what kind of technology and stacks are being, you know, brought in. Of course, every every market, every geography, every region is trying to bring the set of regulation to make this better mandated and better, uh, you know, from a consumer standpoint. Uh, but what becomes a key differentiator here is going to be your ability to program manage them, track them with some of the best uh, metrics and uh, see how, how you increase your consumers in those specific uh, offering of your prepaid to use more of your offering, improve their retention, increase their loyalty, uh, use alternate uh, non-fee based uh, revenue models uh, so that you don't uh, uh, don't hit the merchants or the consumers but uh, you know with value added service bring in uh, bring in more more options for the consumers so the transactions are higher the volumes are better and uh, you know where uh, the, we talked about a lot of benefits of moving towards a virtual prepay card so it's a it's a definitive uh, option uh, and a great business potential that needs to be tapped in and uh, actively leveraged in different economies for not only uh, the existing bank customers, but significantly high for the financial inclusion, the unbanked and underbanked segments. So with that, I feel, uh, you know, it's an opportunity space for better technology and better problems to solve. And I see a huge possibility for everyone here. Thank you. Thanks, Satish. Femi, any final thoughts from your side? Okay, um, the consumer needs and change, uh, uh, tastes are changing. Uh, technologies are becoming more and more available and they are all converging. Uh, data, big data is becoming available to provide insights and provide market intelligence. Uh, so there is, I think this is the time for 
both the usual, the acquirer, the program managers, the everybody, and even consumers, uh, to start to look at what uh, we're going to do to make life easy and to make transaction uh, easier for consumers. Why some people, especially in the debunked, look more at how to edge their risks, uh, convenience, and control. Uh, the unbanked still, the, the population is still very large, especially in Africa. And they are all waiting for technologies to be deployed in order to make uh, a payment system available in those areas. Uh, it's not just for convenience, it's actually the heart and home. How to make it available such that everybody in my community, uh, whether big payment or small payment, will accept this form of payment is a challenge and as a, also an opportunity for people in payment industry to still look at, and the population is pretty, pretty huge. Uh, my brother from South Africa said so. We have huge population in Nigeria and all over Africa. And the opportunity is still there for people, anyone that is interested in it, to tap with appropriate technology. Thank you. Thank you, Femi. Some more closing remarks from you? Um, I think one of the confidence that we all have as participants of ecosystem, because two years back, we used to be worried what will happen in prepaid card or card and e-wallet or bank and telco, will they fight? What will they do? I think the great learning was that this will complement each other and they will be part of the ecosystem. And, and I mean, if we look at Vodacom, MTN, MPES, Airtel, I mean, that's four kind of commands. Most of it in Africa, everybody is or will be happening have, having an open look card. So these two will co coexist. And card as an essence of which I mentioned the word card as a service few times, it's a 16 digit number with an expiry date. I think we call it prepaid debit, uh, whatever that will, the form factor will go away. It will be digit, it could be digital first, physical, but it's a 16 digit unique number which will facilitate payments. And lastly, I think MSME has a huge role to play. As Femi mentioned, you cannot issue card where there is no acceptance and not at the current acceptance framework, how QR goes, um, that will be the time we'll say. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your participation today. And, and thank you to all the participants in the webinar. Really appreciate uh, you spending your time with us. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you for the next uh, in our series uh, at a future date. Um, good evening and uh, have, have a great day further. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rishi. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.